I was 19. I had uh, worked for this company that delivered prescriptions, and uh, one of the accounts was Tower Drugs. And um, uh, my dad had his own drug stores, and uh, he also worked um, hard time as a filling pharmacist at the Tower Drug Store, and Russ's dad, you know, owned the drug store. So Russ's dad grabbed me by the ear and drug me across the street and uh, told the guy who was the uh, general manager of the company at the time um, to hire me as a nice kid. I don't know, about a year or so later, we had this little store in the south area of Sacramento, and um, uh, nobody wanted to work there. <laughs> and so they sent me there as the manager, which is the only way they could work there because it was so slow. And... Um, in fact, the only employee was a guy named Mick Martin. Russ had just bought 103,728 cutouts. And there were all this really cool Mercury and Chess Checker Cadet models. Um, it's like the complete Chuck Berry pose that was, you know, all that stuff. You know, I mean, just going back to, you know, the first making LPs. Plus, uh, uh, the complete limelight jazz collection. So it was my job to sort it all out. And so that's what I did for about a month and a half, sorted it all out, listened to them all, and uh, uh, then we opened the San Francisco store, sent most of that stuff down there, which is sold off. And uh, I went, um, where did I go? I went to the Broadway store for a while, then I went to the Juan Evans store for a while, and then when they were... Um, Opening LA, I volunteered to go down there, and so I went down there as like, um, I don't know, the number three guy. And uh, the number two guy was this English guy named Peter Barton, and the manager guy was this guy named uh, Charlie Shaw. And Charlie was one of my first bosses in Sacramento as a store manager. Meanwhile, I laid the friggin' floor of that sunset store by myself. <laughs> and uh, the big retaining wall. So when that store opened, that really um, kind of, I think, was the key to Tower really exploding, to be honest with you. My training was this. When I, was my first day, I walked in and uh, uh, I went to uh, the guy at the counter and said, it was Mike Stewart. So I said, hi, I'm the new guy, Stan. And he goes, oh, great, we heard about you. He yells across the store, hey, Charlie, new guy's here, let's go. They went to lunch. And Mike says, I says, well, I, I thought you knew how to make change. Didn't you work in your dad's drugstore? And look, everything is $1.99. If it's not the stereo, it's two ninety nine. And if it's phase four, or Frank Sinatra, it's three ninety nine. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> With managers, we kind of did it the same way. Um, you know, you, you know, usually we take an assistant manager from store A and make him manager of store B. It was like, okay, here, you know, your manager got any questions for this call, and um, you know, it was pretty easy. And so they, 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 that's how you did it. You know, you didn't have like um, these rules and stuff. But as time went on. You know, we had to have, a, you know, all these rules and manuals and all this kind of stuff, mainly because when we got computerized, finally, um, it, 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 it had to, it wasn't something you could just tell people to do. It, it was a lot of little programming things. Because I wanted to keep as much control locally as possible, therefore they had to do a lot of programming at the local level. We used to have like record company guys coming in all the time, and they needed to buy, um, you know, their competitors' products. So, like, if you work for RCA, you wanted to, you know, get, um, you know, Columbia's product to see what they were doing. And these were like the, you know, the the, the assistants to the presidents of all these record companies. Oh, well, we had a program in Sacramento where we would. Um, because we had bookstores, we had um, an AR department that would, you know, charge libraries. So 
so one day, I said, you know, I think his name was Bob Garcia. He worked for A&M. And I said, so why don't we just open it up like a library? And, you know, you can just get whatever you want. And then uh, you can either replace it with product or, you know, pay the bill, whatever is easiest. And so every single artist with A&M found out about it. So they'd come into the store and charge all of these records to A&M. And A&M you know, would just send us, you know, Carol King records or something. You know, we didn't care. And, uh, you know, if it was stuff we couldn't use, we could return it. So, you know, who cares? Well, all the other record companies got charge accounts. So pretty soon, everybody who was anybody had an account at power. And therefore, you know, if you were just a, you know, Joe Blow customer and came in, you would see, you know, some recording artist or somebody there. Maybe Clive Davis or somebody was coming to town and had some new act and uh, um, the salespeople were like all freaked out that he was going to come to the store and want to make sure that he could see his record. So, yeah, sure. So we stacked it up and I think he missed it and didn't see it. So we said, we, you know, we had a hundred of it. And they said, well, he couldn't find it. They're all freaked out. They said, well, send him in tomorrow. So we bought I don't know, like 500, stacked it up all the way through the ceiling tiles. Back then, there wasn't a lot of releases, and there weren't a lot of independent distributors up north. So we had like this access to all this stuff, okay? And uh, what my philosophy was that if somebody's put out a record, there's a reason for it. You know, someone's going to buy it. Even if it's just the artist's mother, someone's going to buy it. No one's going to spend money to record something that doesn't have, you know, a chance to sell. At least one copy. So, you know, we would buy one each. And uh, um, so that kind of, like, got us on that selection role. Because, you know, I, I would, like, um, the assistant manager in the stores was basically the one that was in charge of buying and scheduling and all that, and the manager was in charge of going to the lunch, I think. So that way we were never out of anything. And, you know, if any, you know, record yokel came in from New York, they could go in the store and see their product and all that kind of stuff. I didn't know anybody in that way. And so the salesmen were my age, and uh, so we all became friends. So the salesmen would say, you know, I'm getting all this shit because, you know, you don't have enough, uh, I don't know, ace or something like that. I thought, fine, but then whatever you want, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, everything was 100% returnable, so it really didn't matter. And that was before return penalties and all that kind of stuff. Well, all those salesmen, as the industry grew, became sales managers, branch managers, heads of record companies, blah, blah, blah. So... Skipping a little bit, I think one of our, our legacies um, that Tower had was our personal relationships with the people in the industry. Which is like Elton John used to, uh, he had, I don't know, like three houses, and he wanted one each of every single record that was released for each one of his houses. So every time he came to L.A., We'd have to open the store at 8 o'clock, and he'd come in and go through rack by rack, row by row by row by row. He had an incredible memory of knowing what he had and what he didn't have. And walk out with, like, I don't know, thousand records. And, of course, charged MCA. <laughs> and I remember once... Um, uh, and there was a Johnny Otis record out that was really neat, and they brought Johnny Otis in, you know, to meet him. And uh, I said, you know, I told him, I said, I really like your record. That's really cool. Are you, you know, going to play anywhere soon? And he goes, well, no, not really, you know, don't have any gigs planned or something. I said, oh, man, that's too bad, because I'm getting transferred, I think, pretty soon. And I'd like to see it. You know. Anyway, this conversation got going. Um, so why don't you just play here on a Saturday? It's, you know. And uh, so he, the whole Donnie Otis review came to play in the store. It was hilarious. 
then, of course, everybody wanted, you know, to play or autograph or something like that. And then, uh, you know those boards outside? So there's this guy named Ray who would uh, paint these things in his garage and then stick them up. But before that, he would paint the window itself. And so he'd go on a, on a ladder and sit there and paint each window. Well, he'd start in the morning with a, a quart of orange juice and a quart of vodka. <laughs> and by the time, you know, three o'clock came around, man, he was, he was stockered. So one day I said, hey, Ray, how, you know, how can you drink and do this? He says, well, these things have to look good 50 yards away. So while I'm still, you know, pretty sober, I get the foundation. And then by 2 o'clock, I get the shading so it looks really good from far away. The other thing that Tower did was, is we're always loyal to our vendors. In other words, a guy like that guy, Ray, he was the guy. We didn't, you know, if somebody was going to charge less money or whatever, too bad. Ray's the guy. And, uh, you know, they had to use Ray. He was our guy. Um, you know, if, if uh, uh, in, in the independent distribution business, if two companies had it, and you know, we had been doing business with one company for a long time, we wouldn't switch. We wouldn't do the old well. We can get it cheaper somewhere else. Let's see. We'd always stay loyal. You know, whoever it is. I, you know, we we bought our our bag from the same company for thirty years. And they're, you know, they're, they were Hasidic Jews from New York, and just, we, I love calling them up and saying, they just crack me up. And then when we finally opened in New York, oh, we used to have a ball. They take me to these, uh, kosher Italian restaurants. You know, Parmesan with no cheese. Let's see, 1973. After three years in LA, um, I went to San Francisco because San Francisco was the number one store, but now LA was. So they put me in charge. I fired 30 people in 30 days. It was nuts. But we got this crew together, um, that after, gosh, I would say we always had 41 people. That was the rule. We could only have 41 employees, no matter how busy. You know, as a store group, we kept the 41. That was, the most people you can have at a party and not have it be too big. Out of that group, oh, I would say, gosh, half of them ended up being managers, regional managers, uh, execs in the office. I mean, it was, these were like, I mean, we were all in our 20s, all just kind of learning how to do stuff. And uh, San Francisco was like a magnet for college kids from all over the country, you know, people, I, I heard people that graduated from like Harvard that didn't want to do anything in the straight world and loved jazz. The idea was each store had to be different. And, um, you know, at the end of my career there, the, you know, the banks, and the idiots that they put in to, you know, protect their interests, I guess, they spent all their time stopping that, you know, that, the, that way of running things. So that sense of family, you know, at the store level, you know, I think is unique anywhere. And I, I still think that if those assholes from the banks um, didn't screw it up, but, you know, I think the company could have, you know, still be going. Remember I told you that, you know, we, the boards were free? Well, they wanted to charge for every single inch of space. I mean, because these guys, you know, they found out the reason that Best Buy could sell records for nine ninety nine, at least they thought, was because they got all this money in, quote, Placement money or marketing money, whatever you want to call it. Well, the fact of the matter was that Best Buy had this stupid 
circular that went out every Sunday, and um, who's going to go out every Sunday no matter what? They thought these record guys in the pay for the little square. It looked more profitable. My feeling was, why buy all this stuff when you have to, you know, for, you know, 25, 30 cents in a, a unit for marketing, when if you don't sell it and you send it back, you're going to lose 50 cents, plus the freight, plus the handling, and all that crap. Then you get the fact that it made the store look crappy. I mean, you can walk in and see display, you know, a whole bunch of crap that the record companies were, were promoting that, you know, like, like let's say rap music, putting a bunch of West Coast rap in the front of the New York store wasn't really a smart idea. <laughs> Everything that, that made it cool, they would chip away at. We had this one manager that the wallpaper in the bathroom and Playboy centerfolds. It was, you know, the men's room. But it was four <laughs> centerfolds. There must have been, you know, 10 years worth. And uh, our HR department found out about it and made them take it down. And there was nothing I could do that, you know, you know I kept saying, it's a men's room. Come on. The employees, you know, I, I talked to each one of the, the employees and I, and I got them all to just write a little note saying it didn't bother them. But the, you know, it was like, you know, the potential of a lawsuit was so great that, you know, it just, it was, a, it was an argument that, you know, wasn't worth fighting over. And all the little things starts, you know, chipping away. You have a good classical or you have a good jazz or whatever section, if you have your customers' collection in stock all the time. You know, that, I think to this day, is, is always a great idea. Like, there's a million versions of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, but the, it's the customer's favorite that is always going to be the best one. So, you know, you have all these customers, so you're going to have every, have every one. You know, why insult somebody? It, look, it also looks great for your selected, and if it didn't sell, you returned it. We had this magazine called Pulse, like Rolling Stone. You know, it was all music. We gave it away free, and um, also we did mail order out of our New York store and our London store. We decided that we were going to do more and more mail order, mainly because we saw how successful J and R was. So we cut, we moved that to Sacramento, and the only place we had room for them was with the Pulse people, the music experts, the most the most knowledgeable people in Sacramento anyway. Um, you know, it, it worked out really good. And then, so why don't you let us try it? You know, give us something and we'll sell it and let's see if, you know, if a, if a you know, a traditional company can get in this business and not fire it. So uh, we tried it. It wasn't anything big and, you know, plus the company didn't want to spend really any money in that area, because Russ's whole deal with stores, he, you know, he loved opening stores. They like operating them, he sure liked opening them. So, you know, all the money, you know, just went into expansion on that end, as opposed to, you know, the other. Kind of shift into like the late 80s or 90s, and, um, you know, that, you know, I'm sure Russ waxed prolific on singles, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, you know, the whole singles thing. There was nothing that was that you could buy for a dollar in a record store, okay? We were just spending all of our time. You know, I, I was like screaming and yelling about, we're losing the kids, we're losing the kids, we're losing this generation of video games. You know, they're not buying records. In the meantime, everybody, all the rest of these guys wanted to talk about packaging. There were packaging wars, you know, and they completely took their eye off the ball and were just concerned about packaging because, you know, you know, Higgins had five zillion stores and was too fucking cheap to buy a new rack. I mean, these packaging wars, I mean, they were, God, you know, like cassettes, the record companies would be spending their, their energy placate these, these 
huge chains, you know, we were like never the number one dealer overall. We were always number one class four and number one jazz or number one world or something like that. But overall, we were like probably, you know, three, four, five, somewhere around there. So we didn't have the cloud that the music lands and those guys had. Um, so anyway, these packaging wars, the, the CD packaging is, is, is so crappy. There's no perceived value in that CD package. So here's something that's listed for, I don't know, $15, $16. You know, it just didn't look expensive, you know. So, you know, I think that's, that is, is one of the reasons. And plus, you know, our customers started growing up, you know, buying houses and raising kids and radio played the same 15 songs. Um, disco, you know, happened. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the really great artists of the 70s, you know, they ran out of songs. And, uh, you know, it just started to fade then. You know, everybody was replacing their um, LP collections. You know, so that was great for us because there was tons of deep catalog. And uh, but towards the end, I don't know when those assholes at Best Buy started selling stuff for you know under cost. I mean, you can't pay twelve dollars for something and sell it for ten. It just doesn't work. And the hits were, you know, they were like killing us. You know, the, the customer, you know, it was the beginning of, of, of the dumbing down. You know, four or five titles was a big chunk of the business. And, you know, these discounters were, you know, beating each other up, you know, to give it away for free. We started in, in the late 60s, really expanded in the 70s and 80s. Well, our rents started going up. You know, there's, there's, you know, every year your rent goes up. It's, um, you know, based on the CPIs. So our rents went up. Um, you know, we had these people that were with us for, you know, 20, 25 years. And we weren't paying McDonald's wages. You know, we paid 100% of every single person's health care. I think in Sacramento, we were probably paid for, you know, 20,000 babies that were poor. Um, you know, we were really generous to our employees, and our costs were, you know, were really high. And, uh, you know, that starts catching up with you. A lot of our experts, you know, got to the point where, you know, hmm, you know, I'm, I'm 35, and I've got a wife, I need to buy a house, I, you know, hmm, maybe I should, uh, you know, use my degree and get a real job. Of course, our little accounting, you know, our, our bean counters and our banks and all those people start putting on the pressure to centralize, you know, automatic replenishment, this kind of stuff, and take more and more of, of the say out of the stores. So the kid in El Cajon, who used to run the jazz department, they may sell 20 jazz records in a month, but, you know, he was the jazz guy. It was, it was like the warehouse. You know, it would just come in. He really didn't have much say. So they didn't stick around. Didn't have that, that appeal anymore. So it starts deteriorating, you know, right at the end of the 90s. And another thing was the record, you know, records were just way too expensive. To return something cost a lot of money. You know, there wasn't, you know, 100% guaranteed sales. The stuff that we advertised, you know, was stuff that we got money on, not necessarily stuff that we should advertise. The guy that ran our marketing department, uh, Chris Hobson, uh, got Parkinson's disease and had to retire. And I mean, he and I, got, we were, you know, <laughs> we would go out on the road and just raise tons of money for new stores and stuff. And, um, you know, he was gone and everything, you know, changed that way too. So, you know, it just started... I don't want to say, you know, everything just started crumbling, you know, the industry, everything. And because we had such large expenses and, you know, we didn't have refrigerators to sell or, or any of that other stuff. Let's hated video games. 
we, the video rental, we didn't really like video rentals. You know, we had good video rental in some locations and not so much in others. You know, you can see the number of records and number one record would sell start going down. Plus, we also started competing against ourselves. You know, we would put too many stores in the market. The same thing's happening in California. You know, infrastructure starts deteriorating. Like, the older stores needed painting, they needed floors, they needed new racks. You know, it starts wearing out. You know, rest like opening stores. And, you know, you know, but we have to, like, you know, schedule maintenance and this and that. I mean, you know, it's, ah, you know, so all that kind of stuff, you know, starts, starts hitting.